Um, in our next section, we're going to hear from Sylvia Liu of UK 5G U Blocks and the Institute of Engineering and Richard Foggy from the Knowledge Transfer Next Network discussing an overview of the role of IoT in the 5G era. Welcome. Well, thanks for having us. Um, I'm Richard Foggy from the, the, the KTN. I'm going to be joined by Sylvia Liu uh, from uh, U Blocks to discuss uh, with uh, IoT. Um, it's hard to imagine that it's been three years already. I distinctly recall coming down to um, the uh, Sheffield campus uh, when, when, when Pitchin uh, got going. Uh, so John Clark asked me to uh, sort, of, sort of say a few words. I said, I'm sure I can find um, trade up and get a better expert. So delighted Sylvia's uh, with us. But, but first he asked me to run through sort of where some of the funding opportunities are. So the R&D money, there are two principal pots, um, and this is uh, via Bayes or, or DCMS through the industrial and digital strategies. The industrial facing R&D is delivered through uh, Innovate UK, and currently for this year, that's got a budget of around 900 million pounds. Calls are typically themed to industrial strategic challenges and priorities. You've got a snapshot there of the innovation funding service home screen, uh, 12, 12 competitions uh, open at, at, at the moment. Uh, it's important to note that you're not going to see an IoT call advertised. IoT is hidden, it's smart this, it's smart that. So it's worth checking all these out because there's gonna be some IoT based element to future of flight. Um, electric vehicles, uh, offshore wind, and any number of sort of consumer type uh, offers. There's a link to access the uh, IFS there. I'm sure uh, John and Co will, will distribute this. And there's always SMART. This is uh, Innovate UK's Come Ye All competition. Um, you cannot be out of scope. It is a bit of a cavalry charge, but the good ones can win it. Other R&D funding is available through the digital strategy delivered by DCMS. Now they're more concerned with the here and now connectivity, digital issues that the UK faces. And over the past three years, they've invested about 200 million in 5G testbeds and trials, all of which have some IoT aspects. We've got the learnings from those now, and, and currently there's a, a, a sectoral push going after creative and manufacturing then the health and social care. And they're looking to foster a sort of a marketplace such that people with the, the, the business problems can get in touch with vendors who can give them the capabilities to solve their, their, their challenges. The best source for info for this is the UK 5G uh, Innovation Network. There's a, a, a snapshot there and a, a link to, to access it. Um, I point out the 5G supplier directory tab there. That's where vendors, large and small, advertise their wares. Uh, and I'm delighted to say that does result in um, business partnerships uh, and also some innovation partnerships. The Made Smarter Innovation Network is a big push on uh, manufacturing. And, and really, this is where the industrial and digital strategies meet. It is showcasing industrial IoT and again, looking to foster a marketplace. It will be a networking space where you'll be able to find prospective partners uh, and clients. Best way to keep tap of that is to sign up to the Made Smarter Innovation Network that is delivered by um, KTN. So if we can move on to what I call the real money, and that's uh, that, that's out there in the market. And, and really, this is, you know, play a game of, of, of pick a number. So Fortune Business Insights reckoned that uh, in 2019, uh, the global IoT market was worth about a quarter of a trillion. And that's predicted to rise to about one and a half trillion by uh, 2027. Uh, Seven, CAGR, very healthy, uh, 25%. That's a bit of a telephone number. Uh, and if you hunt round, I, I try to come up with some sort of segmentation. Manufacturing, again, about 116 bill this year, rising to 337 
by 2028. Smart health, a lot of the forecasters are, are noting this one uh, as on the up. 144 billion 2019, growing at 16.2%. Global smart energy market, again, we're seeing a lot of action there. Uh, 124 billion currently ish, uh, look to just about double by uh, 2027. And smart cities, which are perhaps the best instantiation of IoT, discuss, valued at slightly under 100 billion. Uh, for, for, for 21 and growing at a very healthy um, 30%. Well, these, these are all very large numbers um, and personally I find them a bit confusing. So uh, fortunately we have a real expert with us, <laughs> Sylvia Liu. Uh, Sylvia, would you um, like to introduce yourself and give us your insights on with an IoT, and I may interject with a few questions as we go along. Thank you so much, Richard, um, for the invite and having me here. Um, and obviously, you know, you guys are um, deep into IoT and um, knowledgeable about these subjects. Um, so I'd like to just uh, mention a couple of, um, you know, insight in terms of what industry is going, what is a hot in IoT. But let me start with first of all, uh, look at where we are now. Um, so the global IoT device connections reached more than 11 billion last year. Uh, so, so that's a number for IoT analytics. But if we compare with the prediction actually made 10 years ago, which said that we would see 50 billion devices by 2020, um, then either the forecast went so widely wrong or the IoT has yet to really take off as we still have 40 billion connections to be made. Um, so that could be opportunity there out there and those numbers indeed looks very promising. Uh, so um, we, we see the IoT market is still growing very fast among the variety of IoT connectivity technology. The fastest growing ones are LPWA, low power wide area networks as you guys can be familiar with. Those technologies like Nova IoT, LTM, uh, which operate in the license spectrums, are really um, fly, if you like. Um, we've seen more than 100 operators adopt this technology globally. They are based on 4G cellular interface. Um, and I also can touch on later, there's a 5G flavor coming up in the, in, in the, in the road as well. Uh, so we expect still to see continuing uh, those guys, um, LPWA, dominant the market in the next coming five years, um, you know, leading um, its race against, you know, Fix, you know Six Fox, Alora, they're also uh, taking a share part, fair part of the share in the market. Um, the, the reason behind uh, this, this fast adoption of LPWA is really because of global standardization bodies, uh, which uh, enable that uh, in oper interoperability uh, globally, and uh, also, you know, um, because of global standards and, and that enable the economic scale for mass market. So that's a technology uh, which I'm deeply involved um, enabling LPWA standards um, in 3GPP. Uh, that's, that was between 2013 and 2016. Um, and I introduced a new um, low power class, power class six, essentially to enable, you know, form factor constrained devices that operate in coin cell batteries. Um, and so in terms of what's hot, um, we, we certainly see growing opportunities still in the consumer market, uh, industrial, as Richard, you mentioned already, this is manufacturing industry 4.0, that's a big push, um, not just in the UK, but also uh, in Europe and also international, international um, different regions. Uh, automotive markets also uh, taking that um, um, in, in terms of adoption of IOTs and or, or the you know, you know site link if you like the uh, the D two D flavor of, of the uh, cellular V two X so that's also part of that you know whole picture. Uh, so in the consumer sector, it's, it's not perhaps not uh, you know for the toasters which you need a need an IOT chipset there. Um, but, but really for applications like home security, fitness trackers, um, it is really important these days when you, you know, doing exercise at home, you probably want to know how you perform. Healthcare, that's another one, uh, which you trade me also mentioned early in the number. And then really uh, what we see a big growth and is high potential is the industrial sector. 
um, it was triggered by Industry 4.0, driving digital transformation. Um, those, um, you know, we have a, the factory floor need connectivity, for example, to connect all the machine machinery sensors and also collect those data in real time um, from those devices and, and um, you know, processing the cloud essentially to close the loop and you can do the monitoring and maintenance purpose. Uh, so, of course, the spectrum, the C-band uh, reserved for local licensing for private network also opened uh, uh, tremendous opportunities for um, uh, SMEs or, or that other companies, uh, which was not traditionally involved in this market, start to innovate and uh, uh, finding, um, you know, new solutions to address with private network RAN solutions. So lots of disruption, but also great opportunities moving forward. Indeed, excellent. You referenced the opportunities for SMEs. Yeah, when you look at the global markets, it, the top 10 continue to dominate and look like they will going forward. Right? SAP, Microsoft, investing heavily uh, in, 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 in their platforms. Um, but yeah, I mean, we've been seeing, particularly in the 5G experimentation, the rise of private networks. So these quite sort of small, localized, almost point connectivity solutions going in that have indeed uh, opened up opportunity for for SMEs. Mm. So everything is the, in the garden is rosy. Uh, does that include um, access to skills, uh, the deep tech, mm. the high tech, mm. big issues around access to, I mean, what's that like from an IoT perspective? That's a very good um, point, Richard. Mm. The skill is one item that needs to be addressed systematically, right? So, um, you know, to be able to innovate, you need that, you know, technical skills, um, be, be able to understand, you know, what, what, how to process signal, um, just to start with, you know, how, how do you um, making sure that the private network is not interfere with the public network, what sort of deployment options you can uh, you can um, um, adopt, and also business skills because it's a it's opening doors for new business models and you know for the private network who's the owner of, of that premises, how do you operate and who's going to be liable if, if things go wrong. Um, business skills, and then thirdly is the um, the if you like intersector um, domain knowledge transformation, and also be able to interpret and really understand you know how do we utilize ICT knowledge applied to the uh, manufacturers. Um, so if Bosch ABB is adopting, for example, 5G on the factory floor private network, what does it mean? What do they need to you know? Where the starting point? So I think I think three, at least systematically, you know, from technical business to sort of intersector knowledge, that are the skill sets, minimum skill set we need to address um, to really get this industry flying. In interesting intersectionality point. What, what I found, I've been doing this for about a hundred years, um, and I and I know is that the tech equivalent of multitasking. Because what I have found increasingly is more and more non-male IOTers, if you will. And indeed, the typical startup that comes to me these days, as, as opposed to 20 years ago, would be 60-40. Uh, and indeed, I'm, I'm seeing female-led IOT companies coming up. Is, is, is this general in the industry? Yeah, I, I wish I lived a hundred years, but uh, looking at, you know, the statistics um, we've seen earlier, indeed, a hundred years ago, there were no women no yeah. in this space. So there's a dramatic improvement. Um, now I'm sitting here, you know, uh, talking about IoT, and I've been working with, with your colleagues, um, you know, and then there's a woman participating and contributing to this industry, but this is not enough. Uh, we we need a uh, um, especially for the for the um, industry sector when uh, when we are you know developing um, a solution um, how do we make you know it more inclusive um, so it, the starting point is that inclusive design starting from the very beginning the design phase um, so we need um, more aspiring you know engineers women engineers females um, you know uh, thinking about um, um, how do you how could you contribute to this industry and uh, be part of the conversation? Um, yeah, so 
really looking forward, you know, with, with the funding that Richard that you mentioned earlier, um, if, if if uh, if that could open doors for more aspiring women engineers uh, entering yeah. into space, that'd be fantastic. Indeed. And okay, uh, uh, mildly controversial. I think think we've got time for one more. Um, geopolitics. The the G seven has just concluded. Um, there does seem to be. I don't know. Is there there a a technology curtain developing between, if you will, the West and Northeast Asia, as we call China the, 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 these days. Do you think that's going to have impacts on supply chains, sourcing of technologies? How, how, how do you think that will will pan out? Bearing in mind we can predict anything except the future. <laughs> well, yeah, that's a very interesting question, Richard. Um, so reflecting on what worked in the past if i may use 3gpp this global standardization uh, mechanism or framework that it has been a, a success story of a global um, single standards body where different stakeholders from across the globe because that's open standards right everyone can contribute and, and see what's going on and that helped us to move from 2g 3g 4g and now 5g and that need global, if you like, um, contribution. So openness, um, um, you know, global standards to enable um, interoperability, especially important for telecom industry, as we all know that you roam from one country to the other, you need that, um, um, you know, same, same as standards. So I think, I think reflecting on this model, it, it is really interesting, you know, purely from technology perspective, um, one technology might work in one particular country addressing a particular market but if you really want to um open that mass mass market and uh, um if you like um have the optimal supply chain um with economic skill uh, then we are really looking at this global if you like landscape to enable so we need that sort of machine single standard open standards uh, you know and an advanced technology. So if you like, you know, that somebody said the future is here, it's just not uh, equally distributed, right? Yes. So I think I think that applies equally here, whether it's IoT, whether it's 5G, uh, we'd like to see that equally apply, not just in China, not just in UK, but of course, uh, the other region in the country to, to really let everybody benefit the advance of technology. Uh, so we have everyone in this room uh, have a role to play. Thanks very much, Sylvia. Okay, I, I I expect they're running late, and so we'll we'll wind it up there. Uh, thanks very much for for giving us your insights. Um, uh, I've been Richard Foggy. That's been Sylvia Lou. Crack on pitching. Thanks very much. Thank you. Many thanks to Sylvia and Richard for that session. Um, we'll now uh, move to Professor John Clark, who's going to talk about um, towards a connected, resilient society. Okay, so this is the the, the final uh, talk, if you like, in the in the whole conference. So, towards a connected, resilient society, or if you like, uh, where next for pitching and the people on it. Well, actually, that's just take an overview of some of the U important UK societal issues. I said earlier on, it pays to start with the problem and uh, the United Kingdom and indeed quite advanced economies across the world are actually have are not without their problems. So here's a number, COVID-19. Uh, and once we get over this one, the next one, because there will be a, a next one. So the question is, how can we be more resilient to it? Changing demographics. Uh, in different ways, both from basic health uh, through to social care. There's a general belief in some quarters that technology is the answer, mostly because everything else looks phenomenally expensive. There are environmental issues uh, abound and uh, productivity, uh, if you're in the United Kingdom, productivity is a perennial issue and, it's, uh, and it still is. Okay, so a number of important UK societal issues are at hand and you'll be recognize all of these. Uh, more recently, we've seen uh, more political terms which have actually come into the lexicon. That's build back better and leveling up. Uh, 
with, I'll leave you to actually read and to look at some of these. So that's Alec Sharma at the top and, and the Prime Minister Boris Johnson at the bottom. Um, Levelling up may not be the best of terms, incidentally. This is the bit at the bottom. Build Back Better probably has more traction, uh, more worldwide. But there's a general notion that we need to come back from this and build uh, a better place for uh, and more inclusive place for, for more people that some people have got, have suffered greatly under, under the pandemic. And uh, we need to make sure that doesn't happen again. We need to alleviate the conditions and improve the, the conditions uh, and their place in society. And that's loosely speaking, what Build Back Better, Leveling Up, call it what you mail, uh, is actually getting at. But so these are big initiatives. Uh, other initiatives to actually bring that about, well, we've got the industrial strategy, which is, of course is, was the uh, primary motivator for the CCF program, the Connected Capability Fund program, of which pitching is one. We made smarter, sort of like the uh, digitizing British manufacturing uh, uh, report, which came out, was done for government. Uh, really great report, incidentally, I'd recommend it uh, to anyone. So if you look at Made Smarter Report and UK government, you'll find a reference to it. Healthy Aging Initiatives, these are the research councils, and in fact, the uh, European Union is is a number of these uh, uh, play at the moment. Net Zero Carbon, uh, Net Zero more generally, in fact, uh, are major initiatives. Leveling up Build by Better, as we saw earlier, the R&D Roadmap, uh, which was, uh, I think, probably last year, or maybe just over a year ago. Um, and the uh, Prime Minister's 10-point green plan. So there are all of these sort of things looking to improve some aspect of uh, UK society or its operation. The big initiatives in play. So what does this mean for IoT? Well, likely it means opportunities, frankly, uh, as you might expect from somebody who's uh, heading a, 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 an IoT uh, project. Uh, so, uh, well, that's it. I'm, that's what I'm sticking to. Let me let me show you what I mean by that. So, well, actually, you can see more log logistics. Here are some uh, some... Uh, fairly recent um, uh, things which have appeared in the press. Now, one of the things where things become, uh, uh, where economics becomes more volatile and trading, in fact, has become more volatile is that logistics uh, become volatile. Logistics are important at any time. And in times of pandemics, they're critically important. And there's been a number of uh, issues of interest with respect to logistics and supply chains. And of course, supply chains are a big interest for uh, uh, for some of the people in pitch in. So there's a warehouse shortage uh, because people are now uh, trying to stock more to actually eventually act as a buffer against uh, interruption of supply. There are political considerations at work. In the United Kingdom, we have had Brexit. I'm not going to make any, any statement on, on that, but it does mean that the supply chains and the organization and the administration needs to differ. Uh, so you're going to see more logistics and uh, and we're into logistics, so we're going to continue that. Energy Internet and active, uh, active Buildings, we're becoming much more environmentally conscious full stop. Uh, and the nature of energy is changing as well. So as I said earlier, when I uh, was talking about introduction to various themes, um, we're going to see more localized uh, energy distribution management and marketing, in fact, uh, uh, at hand. It's not just all about the national grid these days. The question is how to local, local uh, energy systems uh, where do they sit with respect to the national infrastructure and how do you actually work cooperatively to ensure that uh, uh, has a good result overall. The notion of active buildings, which is uh, uh, we are working with Sheffield and Newcastle are working on active buildings inc incidentally. Uh, there's a, and Oxford, of course, have taken the lead in energy internet or uh, concentrating on those sort of things you actually see there. You're going to see more of that for sure. Energy and green efficient energy in particular uh, is big news. So for workspaces, so you're going to see much more in the workspace. This is, uh, you, I give a link here, uh, more of this sort of thing. This was uh, developed under COVID, but we cannot actually undergo the economic shocks that we have undergone with the current pandemic. Next time, and there will be a next time, uh, we need to carry on in a better fashion. We need to be resilient, and that's part of the, uh, the resilience we talked about earlier. You can see more collaborative robots. Robots are everywhere. They're growing in number. They're getting more sophisticated. And now they're even working with people. So the question here is, how do people and robots work uh, in proximity to each other uh, to collaborate to best effect? And so you're going to see more of these. And uh, the notion of collaborative robots varies a bit. So you might actually get people in a manufacturing or in a, a work uh, uh, 
a work environment, handing things over to robots and taking them off, you're going to see collaborative robots in hospitals, social care robots, educational robots, things where they come into, into contact with people. Uh, this is both dangerous physically for some of them. Uh, some, some robots uh, handle are very powerful and handle uh, pretty big loads and sometimes actually have rather nasty equipment at the end of their, as their end effectors. Uh, they, you need to ensure that those things are safe and that's a challenge in itself. But there are even, even subtle things like uh, an educational robot. You've got to be very careful how you program, uh, you, you uh, ask an educational robot to respond to children. Uh, you don't want your child slighted by an educational robot, which is quite clearly not its friend, etc. So it's actually psychologically very interesting and educationally very interesting. So even things like just, just operating in a, what is essentially a psychologically laden and uh, a quite volatile environment in many ways actually presents problems. And just going back over today, we said, you know, I was really glad to see the, the non-IoT people involved. We're not going to solve those problems by IoT. IoT may be part of the technology to deliver those, but you're going to actually have to engage much wider with stakeholders, with educationists, with psychiatrists, with psychologists, in order to affect this sort of uh, uh, efficacious working between people, often and some vulnerable people at that, and robotic technology. So it's, it's great, great news ahead if you work in, in that sort of area. Others, you might say, connected health and well-being. Uh, health, one of the things we've learned from the pandemic is health, mental well-being, just general well-being, in fact, is critically important. And we're going to see much more of connected health and well-being. Uh, technology actually taken on by local authorities and government and the health sector in order to deliver services uh, more efficiently. Uh, I think so. Education, you can see much more. More in the home, incidentally, just if I could give a, a personal view uh, on uh, problems in the home. Uh, security in home IoT is going to be a nightmare, right? <laughs> I promise you. Uh, it's the biggest hole, I think, around at the moment. And of course, in a sense, it's critical national infrastructure because if there's a problem in bits of one home internet, there's likely to be uh, uh, problems quite widespread. The notion of uh, standards, which people talk about as if they're a good thing, write once, use everywhere, in security terms becomes break once, break everywhere. And we're going to have to deal with that sort of thing, both in national infrastructure in the in the electricity distribution and metering infrastructure but also just in the home infrastructures as well it's likely to be a big problem how do we actually protect vulnerable people one of the things that the pandemic actually uh, taught us is that vulnerable people and their monitoring and the people who actually usually care for them uh well, largely set adrift because the visits were off. If you have mental health issues or you have uh, uh, abuse issues, protection issues, safety issues, child safety issues, for example, what happens when you know, the ability to conduct your job of protection actually goes down? We're going to have to do much more in that sort of, and perhaps IoT can help there. Connected transport management, we're going to see more smart, smart transport. We're already seeing it with the emergence of, I suppose, uh, cars like you know, Tesla and things like this, but actually much more integrated than smart networks and transport networks you're going to see more of. General data analytics and pooling, there's a lot of appetite across the four sites to actually engage in uh, collaboration, to exchange data, in particular to exchange processes and methods for exchanging data in the local systems in particular. Uh, data sharing is uh, can, can be a great enabler. There are lots of reasons why people don't want to engage in it. It's mostly for confidentiality reasons. Uh, um, protection reasons. And that's what you're going to see more in the general data analytics and pooling areas. The way ahead, as we would see it, is to solutions to all of those problems. So you see the raft of societal problems for an extremely advanced economy, which is what the United Kingdom is right at the beginning. The solutions does go way beyond IoT, but IoT is part of that. And IoT specialists talking to the psychologists, uh, so we saw, uh, talking to the medical professions, talking to the health and sociologists, etc., cetera, uh, talking to the farming industry, agri-tech and all the rest of it, can actually be a part of the solutions to some of those problems, that whole raft of problems you actually saw earlier. We envisage a major research and innovation center, an institute in Build Back Better. We won't use that title, but you get the idea. What happens if we get uh, both the techie people, I'm a born, uh, died in the mud techie, incidentally, I'm a, a born again number cruncher, a mathematician and statistician by, by trade and a cryptographer and security specialist lastly. But you know, what happens when we get the techie specialists there, uh, the non-technical, in a sense, the problem and domain uh, specialists from elsewhere into the same center and to create a cradle to grave, a blue sky research right down to engaging and solving real problems on the ground. Uh, 
uh, actually, it's not so easy to find where that should be uh, sponsored from because the research councils, for example, only deal with the, the, uh, the top four uh, technology readiness levels. Um, and that's for state aid reasons, largely. You need to be careful uh, what you sponsor. Um, so by and large, uh, we are looking to way to bring about that cradle to grave right through from top to bottom, blue sky research, right down to stuff on the ground solving real problems. I probably that, yeah, cradle to grave uh, innovation, research and innovation pipeline, I'm looking around. Major involvement we anticipate from local government as problem holders, city councils, left, et cetera, but also input uh, we would expect from uh, SMEs, big OMEs, big tech, and things like this. We're also looking to collaborate on EPSSC program grants, which are much more research focused, but major top class collaborations. And with that, thank you. That's 12.40. I think that's about 10 minutes. Thank you very much for that, John. Very interesting presentation.